Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The basis for the message this evening is the gospel reading that we just heard from John chapter 13. We begin with prayer. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, our Savior, it was the night before his crucifixion, and Jesus was gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem with his disciples, celebrating the Passover for the last time with them. And we're going to be spending our Wednesday nights in this room and listening to what Jesus says and, and seeing what, what he does. During the Passover meal, he said some startling news. He said that, that one of the people who were so close to him, who had followed him for so many years and left everything to follow him, was going to betray him and hand him over to death. And that turned out to be Judas. And Jesus turned to him and he said, what you have to do, go and do quickly. And as we heard, Judas leaves. And then Jesus says some amazing things. He says, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. It's really interesting, isn't it? That now, now at this very moment, now that my suffering and death has kind of been set in motion, now I will be glorified. Now at, at this moment, as this, this process of handing me over to the enemies so that they can kill me is, is in motion, now the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to shine in his greatest glory, and God will shine gloriously in him. It's amazing, isn't it, just how different Jesus' idea of glory is from our idea of glory. I mean, Jesus never speaks about being glorified when, when he calms that, that raging storm in the Sea of Galilee with just a few words, quiet and be still. And Jesus never mentions his glory when he's, he's healing the sick of their diseases and he's driving out demons and he's raising the dead. He doesn't even talk about his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and James and John, where his own appearance literally glowed with the glory from within. And while all of those things are certainly glorious, in Jesus' mind, none of them compared to what was about to take place, his suffering and death for the sins of the world. And with these words, Jesus begins his, his farewell address to his disciples, if you will, recorded in John 13 through 16. And as we look at these words in the next several weeks, we get to see the heart of our Savior, and we get to hear what his will is for us who follow him. And it really isn't all that much that, that's new. He taught his disciples what he had been telling them all along for the past three years, trying to, trying to get them to understand the kind of Savior that he was. And he showed them things that, that he had been showing them all throughout the ministry as, the, as they followed him. And just before he said these words, he had showed them that once again. As they gathered in that upper room in Jerusalem, they had a problem. Back in the days of, of dusty roads and sandals as footwear, when people would go from one place to the other, they would end up with sweaty and dirty and, and grimy feet. And so when you went into a house or into a room, and especially for a meal, there was usually something that would happen before everyone reclined at the table next to each other at the meal. There was a servant who would spend time on his knees with a bucket full of water and with a towel. And he would wash the feet of the guests so that they were nice and clean and good to go for the meal. 
But on this particular night, when Jesus gathered together with his disciples, the problem was there was no servant. And so who washed the disciples' feet? Well, at first, no one did. They all thought that that was beneath them. That's, that's servant's work. But then Jesus got up, and he grabbed a towel and a bucket of water, and he washed all of the disciples' feet. What kind of a savior would do that? It's kind of like having your boss come over for dinner, and then afterwards he's the one who, who clears the table, and he goes into the kitchen, and he's washing your dishes by hand in the sink, and, and you're just reclining on the couch watching TV. Why did Jesus do it? He was showing them what he had been trying to show them and teach them for the past three years. That this is the kind of Savior I am. A Savior who saves by serving and who serves in love. At the beginning of this chapter, John says that on this evening, Jesus loved them all the way to the end. And so he does. He washes their feet in the upper room. But love doesn't stop there. After the Passover meal is over, Jesus institutes his own supper that, that gives them the forgiveness of sins. But love doesn't end there. And he leaves that upper room and he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays for them. And then he allows himself to be arrested for them. But love doesn't stop there. He goes before the Jewish ruling council and then later the Roman governor Pontius Pilate where he's falsely accused and he's abused for them. But love doesn't stop there. He goes all the way to the cross where he suffers every bit of God's wrath against every bit of their sins all the way to the end so that he can say, it is finished, and breathe his last. He loves as much as love can. And when he does that, his disciples see the kind of Savior that they have. Someone who would give them everything, even his own self, because that's what they needed most. And when they saw the way that he loved, as much as love can love, and when we see that too, especially in the Lenten season, as we, the next weeks we read through the Passion history accounts, it changes the way that we hear Jesus' words. As I have loved you. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. What is that? That's love without romance. And that's love without worrying about butterflies in the stomach. That's love that is all about nothing but selfless service. Love that is all about showing love to whoever needs it. And it's not just what Jesus has done for us. It's what he calls forth from us. And right away, our sinful nature, as soon as we hear that, we say, that's a terrible idea. Where is it going to get me if I love people like that? Always forgiving, never demanding, never holding a grudge, always seeking out the benefit of others, even at the cost to myself, never looking to get, always looking to give, if I'm always taking care of others, then, then who's going to be there to take care of me? And to that selfish unbelief, Jesus answers with a voice that echoes his every action on our behalf. His answer, I am. We wonder, who's going to take me when I'm busy taking care of others? And Jesus says, says, I am. 
And just as he washed his, his disciples' feet and then went out to the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed and was arrested and went on trial and ultimately went to the cross to pay for every bit of their sins all the way to the end. So now Jesus, risen from the grave, continues to pour out his love to each of us and care for each of us every day so that we can see again and again the kind of Savior that we have, one who serves and who serves in love. How selfish have we been sometimes? How hungry have we been to have other people take care of us and have their approval and their respect and to just plain have, have fairness in our dealings with others until that hunger starves our souls. And what does Jesus do? He loves you to the end. He takes you by the hand and through his word he walks you back to his cross where he paid for each and every one of those sins and he says, it is finished. How small does your faith feel sometimes? And how weak is your strength to leave your life in your Savior's hands and to let him take care of you while you are taking care of others? How hard is it to serve others in love? It's hard. And so what does your Savior do? He shows you the kind of Savior that he is. Someone who would give you everything, even himself. And that's exactly what he does in his supper. In this bread, Jesus says, this is my body given for you. And this wine, this is my blood poured out for you. He takes his suffering and his death the most glorious thing about him. And he places it directly in your hands and in your mouth to give you forgiveness. And with forgiveness comes strength. So whatever your needs and whatever your fears and whatever your sins, Jesus is there. And he never leaves. He is the Savior who serves in love a love that does not stop and never fails. So don't be afraid, Jesus says. I won't leave you. Repent and turn to me. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return, and trust that I will love you to the end. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. Serve one another and love one another. There is no greater way for you to display my glory and to show others that you belong to me than doing for them what I have done and continue to do for you. This is my will. Love as I have loved you. May God grant that among us. Amen.